sticklebacks. Where is that boy? Greetings. Welcome to This, That, and the Other, where I react to, respond to, comment on, question, or otherwise propound on whatever I find of interest on any given day. Now, today's topic Movie reactions are one of the biggest genres on YouTube these days. Now, not being much of a movie buff myself, I don't pay much attention to most of them. I have no interest in superheroes. But there are dozens of reactions to Peter Jackson's masterpiece. I've seen maybe 10 or 12 of them, and sad to say, they're all largely the same. Now, I've decided that what the world doesn't need now is another reaction to the trilogy. But maybe it could use a reaction to those reactions. So, here we are. This is the beginning of an intended multi-part series about not just these reactions, but also other issues connected with them, like where the movies differ from the books. To start with, the books are much thicker. Uh, what's there that nobody sees and what people see that isn't really there. Now, keep in mind, I am by no means an expert of any kind. Just a keen fan. That's fan, not fanatic. Nor am I a professional narrator, obviously. I can butcher the English language as good as anyone, and the number of knots my tongue can tie itself into is phenomenal. And I hope I can keep up my enthusiasm, since this should be at least a six episode, maybe seven or eight, possibly even more. We'll have to wait and see. I think we should start with some generalities. Now, this is not actually a reaction to the movies as such, except where I feel that there's a scene or some dialogue or something that hasn't receive the attention it should. Or some scenes that are just so iconic, or I just really like. Now we'll start at the beginning and go as long as it seems reasonable for each episode. You know, maybe 18 to 20 minutes each. Which may or may not correspond with film sequences or book chapters. Now, large chunks of the films won't be shown at all. Some scenes may be reduced to just the freeze frame, if appropriate. An occasional clip from another source may show up from time to time. Although the films primarily follow their own books, they do occasionally borrow bits from the others. And even when we actually do stick to their own book, the timelines often differ. And the books are more linear. There are huge chunks of the books that are left out of the movies. If everything was included, there'd have to be a fourth four-hour movie. But to make up for it, there's material added, uh, usually for cinematic reasons, not necessarily to move the story along. Now, I'm getting bogged down in minutia here, which I don't really want to do. I'll cover other peculiarities as they arise. Now let's get on with the movies. After being shown who paid for all this, we'll start with the prologue, from Greek words meaning before the words. Actually, there's two of them. The first is a good start for a story that requires 3,000 years of history to be explained in about seven minutes. Obviously, it needs to be compressed a little. Fortunately, most of the center section is omitted, and we just hear about a few years at the beginning and a few years at the end. Now, this section is important, since it introduces characters and concepts that are central to the story. Many, if not most, reactors either don't pay much attention, or they simply don't remember it. 
Then they spend the next 12 hours asking why this and who's that and what do they mean by such and such. You know, half of those questions could be answered just by paying attention to the prologue and parts of the movie that have gone before. Now, in brief, 20 rings were forged. Three were for the elves, who knew Sauron was watching, so they hid them and rarely used them. Seven for the dwarves, who one way or another managed to lose them all. Four destroyed by dragons, and three somehow obtained by Sauron. And nine for the kings of men, who desired power and were easily corrupted. Sauron didn't take their rings. He took the men themselves. Nine rings, nine men, nine Nazgul. Got it? And of course, one ring to rule them all. Now, the non-corrupted men joined with the elves and decided to give Sauron a good talking to, preferably at sword point. Now, in spite of much death and destruction, the good guys prevailed when Isildur, uh, Aragorn's 39 times great-grandfather, if I count correctly, sliced the one ring, finger and all, off of Sauron. Now, Sauron's physical being was destroyed, although as long as the ring existed, his spirit lingered, albeit much weakened. Despite the rear urgings of Elrond and others, Isildur took the ring. Refusing to destroy it, he headed home. Along the way, he was attacked by some orcs, out for some target practice. Now, the ring wanted no part of it, so it jumped ship, a uh, finger, actually and sank into the mud on the bottom of the river. Now fast forward 2,500 years, and the ring is getting homesick. So it finds another passerby to find it, and starts on its way back south. Enter Smeagol. And exit Smeagol, now known as Gollum from the hideous throat-clearing noise he made. After 500 years hiding from the sun and any living creatures, except fish, which he liked raw and wriggly. One day, against all odds, a lost traveler and riddle fanatic found himself in Gollum's cave, picked up the ring, and escaped. Then, after another sixty years, a new chapter begins. The second prologue is taken largely from the one in the book, although it's shortened considerably. The basic description of hobbits is there, except for the inexplicable omission of why they don't wear shoes. And it's not just the gross-out, overly squeamish reactors. But even the book doesn't say much, and I quote, They seldom wore shoes, since their feet had tough, leathery soles and were clad in thick, curling hair. Unquote. The history and geography of the Shire are totally left out, though bits of them are occasionally referred to in passing at later dates. Being remarked by some, the Hobbit's only real passion is for food. A rather unfair observation, as we have also developed a keen interest in the brewing of ales and the smoking of pipeweed. All right, hold it. Hold it right there. Pipeweed is, was, and always will be nothing more than tobacco. Most reactors glom onto the word weed and giggle about it for the next 12 hours. If I could get pedantic for a moment. A weed is defined as a noxious, unwanted plant, and has been since at least 1200, maybe as early as the late 800s, taking on the additional meaning of Tobacco, around 1600, as the plant started arriving in England. The term only took on its modern slang meaning in the mid-1920s. Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings in the early 50s. Now, he and his social circle would hardly be using the term for a recreational drug. Sorry, rant over. And yes, no doubt to others, our ways seem quaint. <laughs> but today, of all days, it is brought home to me, 
It is no bad thing to celebrate a simple life. You're late. A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Now, this scene doesn't exist in the book, which means the famous, a wizard is never late quote, is a Jacksonian invention and a good one. There is a lot of needed exposition in this scene that appeared in the book at various times in third person narration, which doesn't work well on screen. The entire sequence is in the book as quote, at the end of the second week of September, a cart came in an old man driving all alone. He wore a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows. Quote, unquote. That's all. It does mention that the wagon was full of fireworks and there were a bunch of kids tagging along. from these confounded relatives hanging on the bell all day, never giving me a moment's peace. I want to see mountains again, mountains, Gandalf, and then find somewhere quiet where I can finish my book. Now, just one part of the answer to everyone who keeps asking, if the Shire is so perfect, why does Bilbo want to leave? And the second part of the answer. I'm old, Gandalf. I know I don't look it, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart. I feel thin, sort of stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. I need a holiday, a very long holiday, and I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I mean not to. Now, the party is much the same, but let's be honest. It's a lot of fun, but doesn't really add to the story, except for a few minor points. The Merry and Pippin firework prank doesn't exist. Although it's been established that all of the Shire is there, there's no specific mention of either of them. But we needed to be introduced to them and to their personalities. And this is as good a place as any, since the later pages where they are introduced have been cut. Good. Let's get another one. <laughs> Mary Adolf Brandybuck and Peregrine Took. I might have known. Bilbo's speech is much the same, just a little shorter. The shout outs to all the families are there, as well as the I know half of you and I like half of you bit that put the result in confusion. And the drunken mispronunciation of 111, which I can't do either, which seems to go unnoticed for some strange reason. Now, as an aside, to the best of my recollection, the movies never made mention that Frodo shared that September 22nd birthday with Bilbo. Thus, it was a very special dual celebration. Since Bilbo was 111, a remarkable age, and Frodo turned 33, his coming of age. Many question the Hobbit's lifespan. Now, it's actually much the same as humans, 80 being quite respectable, which is why everyone makes such a big deal about Bilbo being 111, because it is a big deal. There are other questions about ages as well. At the time of the party, Frodo was, as mentioned, 33. Sam was 21, Mary 19, and Pippin a mere babe in arms at 11, which makes that prank even more unlikely. When the fellowship was formed, they were all 17 years older, 50, 38, 36, and 28. So technically, Pippin wasn't even an adult yet. He sure acted like it.
I suppose you think that was terribly clever. Come on, Gandalf. Did you see their faces? Now, this scene is pretty much as written, but there are a few lines that are in a different order. Or some have already been used back in the first meeting between Gandalf and Bilbo before the party. Gandalf does get a little annoyed at Bilbo, but he doesn't go full Darth Vader on him like uh, in the film. There is one little thing I do want to point out, and that's the thud. This ring of yours, is that staying too? Yes, yes. It's in an envelope over there on the mantelpiece. No. Wait, it's... Here in my pocket. when Bilbo drops the ring, it's not a little clinky clanky sound and rolling around on the floor. It's a thud. It's a weighty sound. And I don't mean just weight like pounds and ounces, so, although it must feel like it to Bilbo by then. I'm talking about the meaning of weight that means kind of deep and meaningful. That's what that ring drop conveys and almost nobody picks up on it. The ring is yours now. But it's somewhere out of sight. Now Frodo can pick up the ring without even thinking. Whereas Gandalf gets subjected to a jolt from the Sauron eye. It shows you the difference. Wizards are powerful, and the ring knows it. Hobbits have no desire for power at all. And the ring knows that, too. Some things that I must see to. What things? Questions. Questions that need answering. You've only just arrived. I don't understand. Neither do I. Now, some people seem to think that Gandalf has known all along that this was the ring. The ring. But this dialogue makes it very clear that although he has suspicions, he doesn't know. He doesn't really know. Now, with Gandalf departing for places currently unknown, we will do the same. This is an important point in the course of the movies, and that point will be explained in the next episode. Till then, thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.